Okay, so we're continuing our series on the sacraments of proclamation this morning. Uh, last week, Pastor Chris reminded us uh, that what we proclaim is the same thing that Christ was proclaiming, the coming of the kingdom of God, which is most fully revealed in the person of Jesus Christ himself and is being realized in the church all down through the 20 centuries that have intervened as we await for his coming in glory. That's the kingdom of, of God. Uh, and it's, it's being realized now. It's not here in its fullness, but it's, it's being realized. I, I love that. We must remember and remind ourselves frequently, just as Paul reminded the church in Corinth when he said, what we proclaim is not ourselves, but Jesus Christ as Lord with ourselves as your servants for Jesus' sake ourselves as your servants for Jesus' sake. So the chief mission of every church that claims Jesus as Lord is to proclaim Jesus as Lord. The chief mission of every church that claims Jesus as Lord is to proclaim Jesus as Lord. And the word church is itself an English translation of a Greek word which was itself a translation of a Hebrew word. You following that? And, uh, and the word in English, church, is a translation of ecclesia, which is a translation of some Hebrew word that I can't pronounce. And, uh, and it simply means, oh, it's synagogue, sorry. <laughs> and uh, yeah, so ecclesia, synagogue, church. It's all the same thing, exactly the same thing, exactly the same word. And it simply means assembly or gathering. And it was a, it was a term that was used in uh, the society of its day, uh, both in, in Rome and in uh, Athens and in Jerusalem and other places. It was a word that simply meant a gathering. And it didn't have the same uh, you know, connotations that church does to us, to our ears. To our ears, church means something entirely else. It's not just a gathering. And so when, when uh, the apostles talk about, uh, and as John does in one of his letters, he says, greetings to you and to the church that meets in your house. It's not the same thing as a house church today. It was their family, their family plus, their family plus, plus, plus probably, but it was a gathering. It was just a gathering. And we'll see where that goes. So one of the most important questions, I suppose, that we could ask about this gathering is, why do we gather? Why are we here? Why not gather someplace else? Why, why are we gathering? Or why not, why gather at all? I mean, in today's world, you don't have to, right? You can, you don't have to gather uh, starting, you know, um, back in the, in the mid-90s as the internet was just about to, to burst onto the scene. My neighbor, who was, we were very close at the time, and uh, my neighbor worked at Radio Shack, and he said, you know, very soon, he said, uh, your, your telephone is gonna be, your television is gonna be, your radio is gonna be, your CD player is gonna be, and I said, stop, that's not possible, that'll never happen. <laughs> right. <laughs> he knew something I didn't know, and so he, was, he and I joked about, you know, Lutherans online. Uh, and we, taught, we joked about, uh, you know, virtual church, where you, you'd go on your computer and you'd type in, you know, what, what size church gathering you wanted to see on your screen, what kind of music they played, what, uh, what the, the hall looked like, uh, you know, kind of uh, population in the pews. You could do all this virtually on your screen. You could even, you know, type in, what, you know, what, kind, what gender pastor you wanted, what size of pastor, you, you want a really large pastor, you can have one. <laughs> yes, I have lost weight, it's a, it's a reduction, okay? <laughs> and, and none of you had anything to do with that, you did not type into your screen, and, and I'm not actually just a hologram here, I'm real. Uh, and and so, <clears throat> so we talked about this virtual church and you know what? It's becoming a, a, a reality. People are staying home in groves. 
and still thinking that they're connected to the church. Why do we gather? I think a lot of people who've been part of churches can't answer that question. You may have been part of your church all your life and not be able to really answer that question. So I think a lot of people, church people, will tell you uh, that they, they gather because of what they get out of church or because of what they put into church. Some people will tell you that they gather because church is a place of hope, of community, of healing, of good works. Some people will tell you that it, we're a gathering where like-minded people can express commonly held core beliefs and values. That could be good, that can also be bad because the angle that we put on it can be very dangerous, especially if our core values become political. Some will tell you that church is, uh, is there to gather to mobilize for social change. Most church people can tell you that all of it somehow or another has to do with Jesus. Most church people can at least identify that. But that most of us see Jesus as somewhere in the background and something else as in the foreground of that equation of why I come to church, why I'm part of the, the gathering, part of the ecclesia, part of the synagogue. Why am I here? And it's so easy for a church to get off base when we don't know for sure why we're here. So here it is then, definitively, the church is principally a gathering, an assembly for the purpose of proclaiming Jesus Christ as Lord. That is the principal reason why you and I gather. Now, you may have your own reasons, but they need to be in the background. They need not be in the foreground. We don't want those, those other reasons, as good as they are. I think the church should be a, so, a force for social change. I think that the church does offer healing, and it does offer health. It does offer uh, all the things I've just mentioned. But they need to be submitted to the overarching goal that, the, that we are here to proclaim Jesus Christ as Lord. Now, we're going to look at this in depth in a few weeks because we're going to go back to our, our uh, values statements and, and look at them in depth. Uh, but we proclaim, which was, was one of our values that we were talking about, we proclaim is both one of our highly held values, and it's also the primary reason why we're a church together. So it, it actually functions in two areas. It's not just a value, it's a core belief. It's something that binds us as one. Jesus Christ as Lord is what binds us together as one body. And that's why we need to frame our two sacraments, the Lord's table and baptism, as public proclamation. That's why we need to do that. You cannot go into your private prayer closet and celebrate communion, right? Right? Uh, you, you can take a loaf of bread and a cup of wine and you can, say, you can even say the words that Jesus said at the table. And you can eat and you can drink and you can do it all with thanksgiving. And you can, you can absolutely do everything that we do when we gather at the table. And it would not be communion if you're doing it alone. Now that does not mean that the church never offers communion to somebody who cannot come into our midst we do, but I'm bringing communion to somebody like that so that they can be part of a body that has already done that and not, in, not with any implication that this person and I are just sitting down and having our bread and our cup together. All right, so, so the reason is clear. Jesus put the elements before his disciples at the Last Supper in such a way that eating and drinking these elements would be meaningless without what I called in the first segment of this series the crossroads of communion. The crossroads of communion is community in Christ. That has to be present before it's the Lord's table. Have you ever sat down in a restaurant to dine alone? You ever had to do that? Mm -hmm. I've done it a few times, not 
very often because it seems to me a waste of money to bother to do that. But the food tastes the same when you sit down in a restaurant all by yourself. There's nothing that's changed about what you're eating. But something dramatic changes when you're sitting at that same table in that same restaurant with six of your friends or with your family. Something dramatic changes. And community is present, and community is experienced around that table. See? So if you were to try and, and replicate the elements of communion at home alone, with nobody else present, including you know, whatever family members, if you were all alone, you couldn't replicate it because Christ is present in his body, in the, in the family of Christ, and something would be missing. Similarly, you can't go off in secret and baptize yourself. <laughs> we have a word for that. It's called a bath. <laughs> I don't invite people to take a bath with me. <laughs> My tub's not that large. <clears throat> but I've been present when I was the only other person and someone was being baptized. And I can tell you, it was a completely different experience, even with me and the one other person, than when I've been present and the body of Christ gathered around to enjoy, to experience, to proclaim together what baptism is. We all need to eat. We all need to be cleaned. We all need community. The thesis for, in fact, for what I'm going to be talking about on Christmas Eve, I'll give you a little taste of this just in advance, so you'll come on Christmas Eve, 5 o'clock, 5 in the afternoon, be here, okay? Uh, but the, the thesis for what I'm going to be talking about is, uh, you know, it's called putting it all together. Because we all need to eat. We all need to be clean. We all need community. But without Christ, there's something missing. We need to eat in Christ together. We need to be baptized into Christ together. And that is where God does the work of proclaiming King Jesus and his kingdom, as Chris reminded us last week. So I want you to turn just, uh, I'm going to try and move very quickly through this um, so that your roast doesn't burn at home. Um, and uh, turn to Mark chapter 1, what I read to you earlier. Mark 1, second gospel, two-thirds of the way through the book. Mark 1. It should come to no, as no surprise to us, based on what I just said, when we look at Mark's account of Jesus' baptism by John, that uh, Jesus was baptized in the most public way possible. Look at what, the way that Mark puts it in chapter 1. I, I, I love the way that this works. Verse 1, chapter 1, verse 1. The beginning of the good news, the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. It is the gospel, first of all. Gospel is proclamation. It is good news. And news is proclamation. Whatever you may think of the news today, it's proclamation. They're proclaiming something. But every time you turn on the TV or every time you, you uh, open up your computer and look at the news, someone's proclaiming something. And this is the gospel, the good news about Jesus. And it is proclamation. Verse 2. It came through the prophet Isaiah. By definition, a prophet proclaims. That's what prophets do. Now, Isaiah told, he proclaimed. He told that a messenger would come, another 
prophet would come, a proclaimer would come. So one proclaimer was proclaiming about another proclaimer proclaiming. Verse three, a voice crying, proclaiming in the desert places. That is even where nobody would listen. The voice was going to be proclaiming. Make straight a path for the Lord. Make a straight way for the coming of the Lord. That's John's proclamation. Make straight a way for the Lord. But John's application is particular to John. Verse 4 tells us John appeared. He didn't appear out of nowhere. But Mark doesn't give us any of the details that Luke does or that you find in other places in the scriptures. All that, all that Mark says is John appeared. In fact, at this point, Mark doesn't even identify John by his primary activity. What was his primary activity? We know people call him John the... Altogether. Baptist, right, okay. So that wasn't his name, okay? <laughs> you know, uh, it, was, it was not, you know, John de Baptist, you know, kind of a Dutch way of saying it. No, it was John and, and his principal activity. Now, that should tell us something about how people will identify us. Because he's become known to us as John the Baptist. It's known by his principal activity. You know, when I'm gone, I don't want people to call me John the Congregationalist. I really don't. I don't want people to call me, you know, to remember me as John the Pastor or John the Musician or John the Theologian, even though I do all of those things. I don't even want people to identify me by my family name, you know, or by, by my relations. John, the father of Tim and Beth, the grandfather of River, Eli, and Shepherd, no matter how famous the three of them become. And, <laughs> and they will, okay? <clears throat> Grandparents' rights. When, when I'm gone, I want people to simply say of me that I was John, the Christ follower. That's what I want people to remember me as. All those other designations speak about how I applied the gospel, about how Jesus worked with me to apply the gospel. So John's proclamation was make a straight way for the Lord, make a way for his coming. John's application was how he went about doing it. And John applied his relationship with God, Mark says, by baptizing in the wilderness and proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. John's method of proclamation was a call to all Israel to get in order what they could get in order before Christ was revealed because it, was, it is so much easier to grasp who Christ is, to recognize Christ if you're already in a position of repentance toward God than it would be if you're just going on with your daily business, not even taking notice of it. Now, all in verse 4, John knew what God had told him to do, and God knew how, or, and John rather, knew how to do it. John knew what God had told him to do, and he knew how to do it. Here it is. He appeared as he went out. His method was baptizing. His location was in the wilderness, and his offer was the forgiveness of sins. And he did it all in a very Old Testament way, but in a very radical Old Testament way. Just as an aside, there's something important here for us from uh, having to do with PCC, though our name as a church doesn't appear on this passage. It's in verse 5. John, John stuck to the one thing that he knew God had told him to do. And, and folks, we need to stick to the one thing that God has told us how to do. He, it, you, you are the best PCC that anyone could ever imagine because you're the only one that there is. And, uh, and we've been laboring to identify what our core values are so that we can make sure that we do what God has called us to do and that we find a method that's consistent with what he's called us to do and who we are. Ancient Israel 
did practice baptism. Did you know that? Ancient Israel practiced baptism all the time. Uh, an article in Christianity Today in 2008 tells us the story. It says that in first century Judaism, baptism had a different meaning than it does today. In the book of Leviticus, God instructed the Jews to cleanse themselves from, uh, from ritual impurities, like contact through, uh, you know, physical contact with a corpse or a leper. Washing primarily fulfilled the legal requirements of ritual purity so that Jews could sacrifice at the temple. Later, God-fearers and righteous Gentiles were added in to Israel, and they expressed their desire to convert to Judaism, and so the priests broadened the rite of ritual washings to perform baptism as a sign of the covenant given to Abraham. There you are. That's the Old Testament basis for it. The Jews of John's day were baptized in the city near the temple. In the city near the temple. John turns up where? In the wilderness. And, you know, he's up in the hill country outside of, uh, you know, up in the north, uh, way up outside of Jerusalem, not anywhere near the city. And he's dressed strangely, and he wears something absolutely not the uniform of the day. In fact, you would not have seen somebody going into the temple wearing a hair shirt. I can guarantee it. Uh, he did not wear the uniform of the day that priests and theologians and teachers of the law would have worn. Today, we would have called that countercultural. He was absolutely uh, identifying himself completely outside of the culture of those who baptize. Because in those days, those who baptized wore robes. And those who baptized were the priests and the Levites and the scribes and the, the teachers of the law and the rabbis. And that's who did that. And they had a uniform even then. We would call him countercultural. Look, PCC does not fit into the mold of contemporary churches, at least not the ones I know. And, and we also don't fit into the mold of traditional churches. We're someplace else. We're not what you'd expect to find. And even though our facility looks like a lot of old church buildings, and what goes on here doesn't fit uh, you know, a lot of the expectations that people have of churches. The really important takeaway for us is in verse 5 is, is that PCC was planted in, in 1841 in what turns out to be a completely ridiculous location. In 1841, it was right near you know, a, a burgeoning factory. It was going to be its own little town, and so they thought they needed a church here. In 2017... I don't know a single church planter who would want to plant their church here. The reason you don't want to do that is because when I tell people where our church is, I always have to tell them we're about a mile south of the airport. If they know Windsor at all, I can say, well, we're about four doors down from Brown's Orchard, Brown's Farm, rather. Uh, you know, but people who, you know, I usually say, well, we're on Route 75, and that's the truck route. <laughs> you know, through to the airport. This isn't where you'd plant a church, where it's a busy street. People don't walk up and down here. They don't see us all the time. But look, if you know who you are and you know what God has called you to do, you can be like John and appear in a ridiculous place. Feeding people, body and soul, that's what we do. And God will bring to you all, everyone whom he's called. In John's case, he ultimately came down from the hill country and placed himself by the boat docks. Where? Way out by Jericho, not in Jerusalem. Someplace on the river. That was the last place on earth that anyone would have suggested to John if they wanted to attract attention or gain a following for him. Everybody would have said, John, go to the city, go to the temple, go to Jerusalem so that people will see you and, and that they'll know, then they'll know that you've come to baptize. And by the way, John, lose the hair shirt. And, and really, locusts and wild honey, you can do a better diet than that. <laughs> 
You know, I know you're, you know, basically a vegetarian, that's fine. But really, locust, you can, you can, don't be so countercultural, John. Fit in. John's application was to do what God had called him to do in remote places because John's proclamation was foretold to be the voice of one crying in the wilderness. He had to obey God. He had to do what he was, what he was commissioned to do. Whether you think this is a great place to plant a church or not, this is where our commission came from. This is where God planted this church in 1841. And we're still here. Why are we here? I'm back to that question. We're here for the proclamation of the gospel. Now let's talk for a second about something else. The, the other gospels fill in a bit of this background. John actually argues, or has John, uh, the Baptist rather, arguing with Jesus. And John tries to stop Jesus from being baptized by him. Isn't that interesting? John tries to stop Jesus. He says, I ought to be baptized by you. John the Baptist had a strong affinity with Isaiah. And Jesus said that John came in the spirit and the power of Elijah. That's, uh, that's a big deal, a big deal prophet. But I think if you'd asked John, he would have never said, I'm a big deal prophet. John would have said, no, I'm the voice of one, you know, that's crying in the wilderness. I'm, I'm just out in the desert and and no one's really going to hear, I'm, I'm just out here, but I'm just doing what God told me to do. And Isaiah's immediate reaction when he saw God was, I'm a man of unclean lips and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. John recognized the irony of being that unclean man and being called upon to baptize the Son of God. And the worst of it from John's position was that he had to do it publicly. It would have been so much easier for John if Jesus had come to him privately and asked to be baptized. You and I need to accept from the outset that proclaiming Christ is going to mean exposing us for who we are and what we are. We need to realize from the outset that we're not up to the task. We really aren't up to the task. I'm not somebody who's truly set myself apart for Christ? If you had to live with me, you'd know that. I'm a walking, talking hypocrisy. If I'll really admit it to myself, am I qualified to deliver the elements of communion to you? Am I qualified to baptize you? And so it must be with anyone who proclaims Christ. The war is between what I know myself to be in my heart and who I know Jesus to be in my heart. I am not worthy to kneel down and untie your shoes, much less to untie the sandals of the Lord of the universe. No wonder more of us don't speak out for Christ publicly. It would hit too real. It would hit too close to the mark. I can't proclaim Christ and keep my presumed position. Isn't it jarring to you when, when you've ever been in the presence of somebody who has really and truly abandoned my own, my rights, my position? Have you ever been in the presence of somebody who was that committed to Christ? It's jarring. It's humbling. And I can tell you in their secret, it's humiliating. Because they have to give up everything that they want for themselves in order for Jesus to be Lord of their life. I have to give up my presumptions of my position, of my own goodness, in order that he might be proclaimed. Now, John also understands the absolute vanity of thinking that he has anything to offer to people. 
I baptized you with water, he says, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. Look, folks, I know how to make a good loaf of bread. Right? I know how to make a good loaf of bread. I know how to feed people with my bread. In fact, I use that tool all the time. But Jesus himself is the bread you need. I just know how to use the ingredients to make a loaf of bread. Jesus is the bread you need. What a humiliation. And how gloriously freeing to know that I have nothing in my hand, nothing to offer to people except Jesus himself. It absolutely relieves me of, of any presumption. Somebody asked me uh, last week after Chris preached, and there was a bunch of wonderful comments that I got about it. I think his, he's not here, so I can tell you. I think his preaching is developing amazingly, and I was so blessed by it. So they, they said, so do you ever get jealous? <laughs> and I said, no way. What an opportunity I've been given. What an opportunity you gave me by stepping out on a financial limb as you have so I could train somebody the way I was not trained. No. But you have to enter into it from a presumption of loss. You have to enter into it from a presumption of humiliation. Otherwise, it'll all go wrong for you. After the resurrection and the ascension of Christ, Peter and John were on their way to the temple and they ran in, into a street beggar who was a cripple. Now, that man thought that being leaders of the church, that John and Peter could give him some money because he saw them taking offerings and things. And they stopped and Peter said to him, I have no silver or gold. They really didn't have anything with them. But what I do have, I give to you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. That's what we proclaim. We proclaim the one who is able to do the healing, who is able to feed you at your deepest level. Now, I want you to see how this all works together, and that will have to wait for Christmas Eve. But just like John, I need to know that my proclamation is how God has called me to apply who he is and that to my own humiliation. For he must increase and I must decrease always. John says, I baptized you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. I have offered you bread. Jesus is the bread of life. I have nothing to offer you. Our community isn't life and health and healing and social justice to you. Jesus is. So we've answered why do we gather. As I said, I'm saving the rest of this for Christmas Eve. But you may have noticed that our church has a bowl on a marble pedestal over here in a corner of the room that we don't pay much attention to unless somebody comes to us for baptism. Baptism played a much more central role in the early church. They reminded one another all the time, you were baptized into Christ. I'm, I can show you 10 scriptures that are the church reminding itself, you were baptized into Christ. There's an old tradition that some churches have of placing the baptismal font at the cross aisle of the church as the people enter. For us, it would be right there. They place it there to remind their people that baptism itself doesn't save you. Peter's clear about this. It is through the resurrection of Christ that you are saved, and baptism is the outward sign of that salvation. They place the baptismal font at the crossroads of the church where people mill about, where people gather, where people bump into one another because baptism is where each of us enters the church. They place it 
as a weekly reminder, you were baptized into Christ. Now, you cannot be, be rebaptized weekly. I would not have you do that because it wouldn't be, it wouldn't be true to what's happened to you. You don't need to be rebaptized. If you've been baptized, you've proclaimed that Christ is in you and that you have been cleansed by Christ. And as we will see in a couple of weeks, the depth of that. But this is such a central part of our proclamation. Should we be ignoring it over in a corner of our lives? Or should we, in fact, place baptism front and center where we'll see it every week? Should baptism be something we remind ourselves of every week? Shouldn't we place baptism where we must interact with the symbol of our cleansing in Christ? That might take a little furniture moving in our church, but it might be worth doing because it would put baptism at the crossroads where baptism was intended to be, at the entry point to the church, at the beginning of our salvation. So here's your question for application. Have you been baptized into Christ? Now, you may not yet understand fully what that is. Clearly, from the uh, passage we read out of Acts, there were early believers who did not yet understand the baptism of Jesus. And it's okay if you don't. It's okay if you've never been baptized, if no one ever invited you to. It's also okay if you were baptized as an infant. I don't particularly myself baptize infants because I believe it's his proclamation. And we'll get into some of those particulars in a later message. But I would not have you be rebaptized as an adult. It's a matter of your own conscience. And so if you have not been baptized and you find through this series that you have a growing desire to be baptized, I want to hear about it. And I hope that by the end of this series, you're going to want what Jesus modeled for us and to be baptized into Christ. All right. So that's your question. Have you been baptized? And if you haven't been, come and see me. I want, to, I want to talk to you about it. And if you're unsure whether or not you were baptized into Christ or into something else, we can talk about that too. This is neither a quaint old rite of passage nor a way to salvation, but it is commanded by Christ. And it is one of the two signs that we have that should regularly remind us of our proclamation of the gospel. Now, before we leave, I want to make, make sure you understand something. I'm not going to pick that up and move it. <laughs> but, but I want you to think about it because if, if we're a radical community in Christ, it might be worth moving carefully, okay? It might be, but I want to hear it from you. I don't want to be the one that imposes it on you. So it stays there until enough of you come to me and say, hey, I think you made a good point there, okay? And I'm not asking, I'm not inviting that either. I just wanted to make sure that you understood that I was saying it because baptism should be front and center in our lives. That was my main point. All right, let's stand and sing to each other and then be on our way to coffee hour and 